Welcome to Treasure Mountain, the podcast that inspires and guides people to find the treasure within human experience. I'm your host, Sol Hanna. In this effort of Spirit Stories, we have as our returning guest, Aya Tataloka from Dhammatarani Monastery and Aranya Bodhi Forest Hermitage in California. Last week, when we spoke to Aya Tataloka, we found out about her journey from discovering Buddhism through many trials until finally being able to achieve her ideal of full ordination as a bhikkhuni. It's a really interesting story of overcoming obstacles with some unexpected twists, and if you want to listen to that episode, you can click on the link in the description below. Aya Tataloka has a number of achievements and been actively involved in establishing and extending the opportunities for women to go forth and also take higher ordination in the big Buddha Sangha. In this episode, we are going to find out about her journey since higher ordination and the work she has done and continues to do to expand opportunities for women to ordain and practice in an authentic manner that is true to the Bhikkhuni Vinaya, the monastic rules for Buddhist nuns. In the process, we will also find out about the rapidly evolving opportunities for women within Buddhism as a result of the work being done by leaders like Ayatataloka. So join us as we find out more about Ayatataloka's spirit story. Welcome to Treasure Mountain, Aya. It's nice to hear from you again. How are you today? Greetings, Sol. Glad to be back with you again. Last time I was speaking with you from our Aranya Bodhi Awakening Forest Hermitage on the Sonoma Coast and today from our Bikunis Damadrini Monastery in the Sonoma Mountain area of the San Francisco North Bay. And I'm glad to be back with you again amidst what is it? Uh, sickness, aging, and death, and so many things all around, and circumstances of life are so fragile and precarious. I'm feeling especially fortunate to be alive and to have the opportunities that we have now, and you know, it's all uncertain. We never know, so making the best of what we've got. Sadhu, well said, well said. Um, well, I mean, there's so much to in your story. I don't want to waste any time. I want to dive straight in this morning. Um, I'd like to pick up from where we left off in the last episode, uh, in which you shared your journey up to your higher ordinations, Bakuni. Um, at that time, there still weren't very many Theravadan Bakunis. One of the challenges uh, you must have faced at the time what, what, what were the challenges oh, after your ordination? I, I can imagine there was quite a few. Yeah, well, you know, at that time, um, my ho- higher ordination as a bhikkhuni came in 1997, which was not quite 10 years into my monastic life. And Aya Kema had just passed away. She was part of the first cohort of Theravada women monastics who went for full bhikkhuni ordination in California in 1988. And they did so through the Dharmaguptaka Nikaya, uh, which is a different Vinaya tradition. It's an early Vinaya tradition. There are three such early Buddhist Vinaya traditions that are still alive and existing today. And one of them is the Theravada Polytext Mahaviharavasan tradition. And one of them is the Chaturvagika Dharmaguptaka tradition, which is widely used for bhikkhu and bhikkhuni ordinations in East Asia and East Asian Buddhist traditions around the world. And then there's the Mula Sarvastivada tradition, which is widely used by the Bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, or bhikshus and bhikshunis of the Tibetan and Himalayan traditions to this day. And I did just say bhikshunis of the Mula Sarvastivada tradition, and that's actually something that was just 
revived in the last couple of months. Really? So that's pretty amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. And I mean, I feel like, wow, in our lifetime, that's incredible. In Bhutan, with the direction and blessings of the king and queen and queen mother of Bhutan and the royal preceptor, there were more than 100 women of Himalayan traditions who received full bhikshuni or a gelongma uh, ordination and you know there have been so many others from tibetan and himalayan traditions over the past you know 30 more than um say 30 years at least uh and quite a number in 1988 also the same time as ayakema uh who received uh who, who got the blessings of their teachers to go out to this other vinaya tradition the east asian dharmaguptaka vinaya tradition and receive full bhikshuni ordination but the issue is that that wasn't in their own Vinaya tradition. And so not the same, they weren't ordained in the same school or the same tradition as the monks, the bhikkhus or the bhikshus, uh, gelong, who were their sangha and their teachers. And so there was this sense then of, of difference and not, then the, the bhikkhunis and the bhikkhus were not of ordained in the same Vinaya tradition. And for Ayakema in that first group in 1988, also it was like that. They also ordained in the Dharmaguptaka tradition. And so that was great and important because there were Theravada women renunciates from around the world who did that. Uh, from Sri Lanka, five of them, and also from Nepal, and then also like Ayakema and Aya, uh, Dhamma from Germany. And um, so that was really important. Uh, and uh, for many people, it didn't seem like, um, it seemed like still there was that one step of separation because it was ordained into a different Vinaya tradition. So then less than 10 years later in 1996, then a whole group of Sri Lankan women uh, led by Venerable Bhikkhuni Kusuma, who passed away of COVID just this last year, uh, then they received full bhikkhuni ordination also in the Dharmaguptaka tradition in Sarnat, India. And that was really important. And as I mentioned in our last uh, podcast interview, I myself at that time was in Korea that was supported by the Korean bhikkhu and bhikkhuni sanghas. Uh, they, they organized that together with the Mahabodhi Society in India and Shakyadita Sri Lanka. And so I was asking, hearing about that at that time, I was in Korea, like, can I go for that? And they said, that's just for the, that was organized for the Sri Lankans, like with Shakyadita Sri Lanka. Uh, and so they also received full ordination in the Dharmaguptaka tradition. And it wasn't until two years later that then those who ordained in 1996 and 1998 had a conversion ceremony, a talikama. They were then accepted by the Sri Lankan Bhikkhu Sangha. And then they went back to Sri Lanka and then they started with Theravada form via the polytext tradition full dual bhikkhuni ordinations in 1998 in Sri Lanka. Yeah. Mm. So my ordination was in 1997. That was before that had happened. So at the time of my ordination in 1997, here at the Ananda Sima Hall at the International Buddhist Meditation Center in Los Angeles, there had not yet been any Theravada ordinations. So on that day in November of 1997, nearly 25 years ago, then what happened was quite unique because Theravada Bhikkhu Sangha, a full Sri Lankan Bhikkhu Sangha, uh, led by my late most venerable preceptor, venerable Dr. Havampola Ratanasara, Nayaka Mahatero, who not long after was appointed as the chief prelate for the Western Hemisphere for Sri Lankan Buddhism, Siam Nikaya, Malwata chapter. That might not make any difference to anybody, but it makes some difference to a lot of people. It's like which order, which school, which tradition, right? 
Uh, so the Siam Nikaya is the one also that from Sri Lanka then like refounded the Bhikkhu Sangha in Thailand and then also the majority of the Bhikkhus in Southeast Asia uh, other than Burma. So then that's something that's important to the Theravada Bhikkhu Sangha. So then there were other candidates from Sri Lanka and from Nepal who had lived for a longer time as nuns in the Theravada tradition as 10 precept nuns and we all received bhikkhuni ordination together in 1997 via the polytext rite according to the traditions of the Siam Nikaya. There were also four bhikkhus there which is a bhikkhu sankha uh, from the Thai Siam Nikaya, it's pronounced in Thai, Siam Nikaya tradition, uh, or Siam Upalivangsa. So the chief abbot of Wat Thai LA, he's long since passed away, but he was a great leader in the Thai Sangha early on here. Then he gave four monks, and that's a full Bhikkhu Sangha, also to participate. So there's a full Sri Lankan Bhikkhu Sangha and full Thai Bhikkhu Sangha, and then also Bhikkhus from like uh, Laos and Vietnam uh, who were there. And there were also Bhikkhunis who were present from the East Asian Dharmaguptaka traditions who gave the exam. Uh, and who were part of the training for weeks beforehand and all of that, but there was no Sangha Karma on their part. No Sangha Karma on their part means there was just the Sangha Karma of the Bhikkhu Sangha in the Polytext tradition uh, that in which we had the ordination. And so this was actually a first uh, at that time. And uh, so that I think I was the first non-Asian uh, woman or uh, female renunciate than to receive that uh, ordination in that way. And there were a number of teachers who had been oh, like amongst our highest level international bhikkhu Theravada Vinaya scholars who had been recommending this method. But you know, those who are supportive are kind of on the fence, like want to acknowledge and appreciate the existing Bhikkhuni Sankhas, but also want to have it be like pure Theravada. And that's like with the power of the Bhikkhu Sankha. And so, you know, my late most venerable preceptor and then the um, Bhikkhu Sankha who gathered together then, you know, accepted his, his word, his knowledge, his authority, his leadership as a preceptor to go ahead with that on that day. So that was that was a first. And uh, then not so long after, in 1998, then the full Theravada Polytext tradition dual bhikkhu and bhikkhuni sankha ordinations began again in Sri Lanka later on in 1998, the next year. So just looking back now, it's nearly 25 years and um, wow, thinking about how it's unfolded from there. I'm interested to know, uh, you said that you were one of the first female renunciates from the West. And of course, you stayed on in the United States, although you've traveled a great deal. Uh, how did you at that point begin practicing? In particular, I mean, becoming a bhikkhuni means that you're keeping the vinya. Uh, so, uh, you know, not having a whole lot of role models, but you do, of course, have uh, the written vinya. How did you start putting that into practice? What challenges did you find with that? Oh, thank you for asking. And I just want to say I absolutely was not one of the first female renunciates from the West. There were so many before me. Uh, just the first Western female renunciate to receive the Bhikkhuni ordination in the polytext yeah. tradition in contemporary times, in the polytext tradition. Mm. So just to be just to be clear about that part. Because um, so many other female renunciates before me, uh, and Western, uh, Westerners as well, already for, you know, for decades before me. Um, so how did I put the, think about putting the Vinaya into practice? I'll say I already started studying um, Bhikkhu and Bhikkhuni Vinaya before that. One of my main sources for studying Bhikkhu Vinaya was the Buddhist monastic code. 
which I found, you know, such a useful resource. And I lamented at that time that there wasn't something similar for bhikkhunis that I could just like just just turn to and be studying and have as my guide. But of course, the bhikkhuni vinaya. Uh, if we look at our Patimoka precepts and 200 some precepts for bhikkhus, 300 some precepts for bhikkhunis, more than 60% are shared, completely shared with the bhikkhu sangha. And then there's a whole other percent that's like almost completely shared. So that's a lot. You say more than half of the discipline is like 100% shared with the bhikkhu sangha. And I had already spent time for, you know, I'd been in monastic life for nearly 10 years by that time. And I'd already spent a good amount of time uh, with uh, Bikuni Sangha in South Korea, learning the way that the Bikuni Sangha lived and practiced. And I had also visited the still existent Bikuni Sanghas in a whole number of other countries, even as I mentioned before, before. I decided to then uh, connect with and uh, make a commitment with um, um, Bikuni Mentor. And also, I had the opportunity to have a lot of time with Bhikkhu Sangha, mostly Bhikkhu Sangha from the Thai forest traditions of Ajahn Cha, or also, you know, connected with Lung Po Man, who is the teacher of Ajahn Cha, and like first and second generation uh, teachers in this tradition, who I look to as an example. Uh, and also from the uh, monks of Sri Lankan traditions, and also my my teachers in the Burmese Vipassana traditions, many of whom are, you know, quite serious and strict about Vinaya, although almost always practicing according to some commentarial traditions. So then that brings in some variety of interpretation according to like which teacher it is. And so, you know, there were the texts themselves and then there were the lived examples from the Bhikkhu Sangha and also from the Bhikkhunis who I had the opportunity to live and train closely together with. And I'll just say for the texts themselves, on the day of my Bhikkhuni ordination, I received a number of gifts, as is normal, people give gifts at that time. You mentioned Venerable Dhammananda in Thailand, although you may have been speaking to me personally, as a documentary came out today. Um, and so Venerable Dhammananda then, as Dr. Chatsuman Kabil Singh, had authored a book, uh, the Bhikkhuni Patimoka of the, I think, of the six schools. And so somebody gave that to me as an ordination present. And so that was really useful and interesting. And then also somebody, one of my Korean bikuni friends, uh, Korean bikuni dama sister, then gave me a book, which is the one that was being given to Korean bikunis at the time they received full ordination at that time. And that one was more, in a way, kind of more like the Buddhist monastic code um, books because it had you know, it has the precepts and then like commentary and analysis, but it was also a comparative Vinaya uh, work uh, that was done by some of the Vinaya masters in Korea who I greatly admired. And then I started to study their work more and more because they did comparative Vinaya work. And that led to me then in studying over like the next, not only the next two years or the next five years, but the next seven years of concerted study of comparative Bhikkhuni Vinaya. And then publishing an internal Sangha book uh, called the uh, Bikuni Handbook, which was uh, then modeled after that text that I had received at the time of my full ordination. And, you know, that was that was one of the things then later on connecting with Bhante Sujato and the studies at Santi Forest Monastery that were then leading up to the first ordinations in Australia when I served as a preceptor for the first time. Then, you know, all that work then led also into Sutta Central to be able to have uh, like a better 
online open access forum to be able to share these comparative studies for Vinaya and also for the suttas and, you know, just, just as widely as possible to make that all accessible. So, you know, a lot of study there that's still really ongoing, ongoing. Mm. It's a great ongoing uh, really path work of life. Um, but I'll remember, I remember something uh, succinctly. Um, you know, I had wanted to meet Lungta Mahabua. I admired his book straight from the heart. And then he had been sick and seemed like not a good time. Finally, I got a chance to, to go to Thailand and to go to visit Wapabantat uh, and to, to meet him. And uh, one of the first, the first Dhamma talk that he gave when I was there, like sitting up front, um, the, the monks had warned me, you know, he, he, will, he will talk about specific people in his Dhamma talk, but he won't name names, but like everybody knows who he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so, then it was my, my first day there sitting up front. He had, he had the Bhikkhu Sangha sit on one side of him. Normally the Bhikkhu Sangha would sit on both sides of him, but he directed on that day, he said in the Buddha's time, the Buddha would sit and then the Bhikkhu Sangha would sit on one side and the Bhikkhuni Sangha would sit on the other side. And so he directed the Sangha to do that. Except for there's this whole lot of Bhikkhu Sangha on one side and there's just one Bhikkhu on the other side. <laughs> and then all these tons of people came in buses from Bangkok to make merit and listen and all of that. And then just one up front there so I was feeling kind of like sticking out like a sore thumb and uh, so then I had uh, I had a, a companion a, a white robed uh, Nekama uh, lay woman uh, who was my traveling companion and who was translating and so then he starts to talk about those who have studied so much in Vinaya in so much detail they, this is the end of my seven years of, of the studies right who have studied in so much detail like this and memorized the numbers and the letters and everything and he says but then they have to go to the next step mm, mm. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and yeah, I, yeah. I could just feel the eyes of the, you know we're looking down right but i kind of like feel the mental eyes of the others who are there and like who is he talking about right uh and so he said then we have to study the uh, Abhivinaya or Adhisila, and then he gave this whole Dhamma talk on Adhisila. Like, what is that? And so he was he was really then giving a very powerful and encouraging talk for you know supporting the study of the letters and numbers, but then also like going much deeper with how we're looking at and how we're practicing the Vinaya. So that was really, you know, that was that was a great encouragement and support that stays with me to this day, to this moment. I remember this, although he's passed away years ago now. No, that's very interesting. It kind of leads me on to the next question because obviously the, you know, putting the, uh, the Vinaya into practice is a, is a challenge in and of itself. But uh, what, what are the other challenges that you that you faced at that time when you're trying to establish? Because in one sense, you know that you're going to be establishing your own practice as a bhikkhuni, but also you, you're kind of leading the way for others as well. And you, you, I guess you must have felt a sense of wanting to do it well. Um, what, what were the challenges, were the biggest challenges, do you think, at that time, apart from um, putting the, the, the veneer into practice? Oh, well... Number one, no support structure in place. <laughs> mm, <laughs> I yeah, say right. that number one, uh, I don't know if you remember from last time, but I had been expatriated back to the United States as a novice. And yeah, there wasn't like a whole lot of support structure just waiting there to, <laughs> to receive me for that. And those who ordained together with me also from Sri Lanka and from Nepal, um, there, it wasn't like, we, I mean, we had come from different places and the Bikuni from Sri Lanka went back to Sri Lanka. And so, yeah, what to do, right? Uh, did you find that so, also, did you find also yeah. that, I mean, you're in the United States and it's, it's not, I mean, there are Buddhists there, but there's not, um, 
it's not a Buddhist culture. Uh, did you find right. that that in itself was like, well, do you find that Americans didn't necessarily know how to support a bhikkhuni, but then also perhaps right. Buddhists, Americans are not, this is a new thing. And what, was there a disconnect there? Did you feel? Um, I, well, not necessarily, you know, there were already quite a lot of Theravada bhikkhus, uh, mm -hmm. in California at that time who had been in a way, in the way that you're talking about, like far more groundbreakers. Mm -hmm. And, um, during that time also, then, um, uh, I think from when I was first expatriated back to the United States, that was the time that also Ajahn Amaro was coming and like having the first Vasa in San Francisco, which led to founding the Abayagiri Monastery, which is just to the north of us here, just to the north of the San Francisco Bay. And I actually really, really admired the work that uh, the founders of Abayagiri, first Ajahn Amaro and then Ajahn Pasano in the community there, the way that they were educating people and introducing people to the monastic life and the sense of the the integrity that mm. they held and their ability that they were showing in a way for the first time that monks who are holding Vinaya can live with the precepts and with integrity here in this American, Californian, Western context. That was just such a powerful example. And I have to say that I was such an, also such an idealist at that time. Many of the other monks who were here were thinking about adaptation to the Western context, adaptation to the Western context, you know, that nearby uh, to where I was, I was in a hermitage in an old ranchero up in the Hayward Hills in the San Francisco East Bay. And uh, then nearby Thai temple, then there was an American monk there and he was advocating like that, that the Buddhist monks should be like Catholic priests and like not even wear robes most of the time, but just wear lay clothing and like just wear robes for special events and things like that. And I'm glad that he didn't gain too much traction with that. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, there are a lot of different views. And so there were so many monks who were coming and who were like, we have to have to be respectful of the lo local culture and like when in Rome, do as the Romans. And I mean, literally, I heard this again and again, that exact saying. And I, being born in the United States, was like, no, let's do Pindapot here. Yeah, right. <laughs> we can have we can have Tudong here. We can do Chadika yeah. here. We can let's let's try Pindapot. And they're like, no, we can't. You know, it's just like we're just this little enclave in the bigger Western culture that would be like offending Western culture. And so it was really, I'd say, like a very fertile time. Um, as a kid, I worked with my mom in the garden and she gave me a pitchfork. And so I know how to turn soil with a pitchfork, right? So you turn, you put in the pitchfork and then you pull back and then the soil opens up and clumps and it gets air and pieces break apart. And, and then this is an important part of making that ground fertile for the seeds uh, that are then uh, put inside and, and grown up in it. And so my experience at that time was so much, we were, we were talking about these things so much and I was really on the side of no, you know, I was I was born in this country. I think we can do this here. And also for the monks at Abayagiri who are Westerners, who are like having success in teaching to Westerners and living with their Vinaya, you know, like, look, if these monks who are also foreigners can can do this, I mean, Ajahn Pasano is just from Canada, so it's not so far away, not so much a foreigner, but Ajahn Amaro from UK to us in the United States is like absolutely very different accent, very cool, but definitely a foreigner. Uh, so I felt like if these monks who are foreigners, but Westerners can do this here, then me as an American, why not? Why can't I too? And you know, I, I really didn't feel like uh, I felt like the level to which some of the monks here were compromising was more than what the circumstance called for, like making too many compromises. So it, it's just my own opinion, right? Also now, I'm talking to you about the past, but right now I actually feel a lot more respect 
that time I was like hair on fire idealist. Now I feel so much more respect uh, really for the variety of ways that monastics and practicing Buddhists with all and seekers with all integrity, with all sincerity may come up with different answers to the same questions. So I, I just feel enormously much more respect for this now. And I've actually tried to advocate, although I do my best with our own monastic community here to live according to, to my ideals and uh, to be, you know, working with the ideals of those who I've drawn together with here. But my respect for others having a different take within bounds and so this is the question what are the bounds right mm -hmm. <laughs> others within bounds i feel like wearing lay clothing is too much i feel like they go and get married that's too much i no, mean if they want to be married <laughs> no problem they can be married there are all these we have tons of fantastic married buddhist teachers here okay can do but not to be a monk right i mean this yeah. is just this is my idealism speaking um but uh, i i really very much um appreciate the the different ways that people with real sincerity and real integrity are developing uh, their way. And as more and more uh, women have fully ordained, uh, then I've really tried to advocate that, you know, not only is like Damadrini, like only this is right, everything else is wrong. I absolutely don't think so. Uh, I feel like what we're doing has its integrity together with all its challenges and, and, and foibles and all these kind of things. Uh, and other places that are not the same also have their integrity. And I really, I want to be able to see as for those who are male aspirants, they have a variety of places that they can go and train and ordain that have different strengths and they can really grow and develop in this in the, the variety of circumstances. Uh, this is something that I know Long Po Cha was for his students. He was deliberately also sending them to other places to learn from other teachers. And the Buddha himself is said to have done that, as to send his students to study with different teachers, different bhikkhus, who had different strengths for them to be able to grow and develop and then commended not just one style, not just the Mahakasapa style, not just the Ananda style, not just the, you know, da da da, uh, like this, the Mahamokalana psychic power style, not, but really valuing each of them. So with that example, I see the brilliance of having a variety of opportunities. So I've tried to really support uh, there being this growing with the, the pitchfork work and turning it over and turning it over, this variety of growing variety of opportunities for the women who wish to enter this path. But we were talking about early in my monastic life, and I didn't start actively serving as a preceptor until, you know, more than 10 years and not as a bhikkhuni preceptor until 12 years later. Mm. Well, let's um, follow up on that as well, because I'm interested to find out about your role as a bhikkhuni preceptor. Um, you were, I believe, the first Western uh, Westerner to become a bhikkhuni preceptor in this tradition. Uh, and as there were very few bhikkhuni preceptors in the world, um, in this tradition, certainly, uh, could you tell us about some of the places that you've been to help establish the bhikkhuni sangha? Because I think that gives us an overview of what, what's been happening. Mm. Yeah, so we're we're skipping ahead in time. This is something that when um, early on in monastic life in those first, you know, nine years, nearly 10 years before I fully ordained, um, I heard again and again that the Bhikkhuni Sangha can't be revived in the Theravada tradition because there are no Bhikkhuni preceptors, because there are no Bhikkhuni Teris and Maha Teris, there are no Bhikkhuni teachers to be able to like accept and instruct and ordain the women. And that's the main reason uh, why it's not possible. And so I just... First of all, I just want to really express my deep joy to see then since that time, the growing number of Terries and now Maha Terries and the growing number of Bhikkhuni preceptors and, you know, to, to not be 
not be the only Westerner, Westerner who is a Bikuni preceptor now also. Um, so uh, from 19... Uh, from 1998, as I mentioned earlier in Sri Lanka, then straight away, three leading bhikkhunis who had just been ordained a short time before in Bodh Gaya, uh, India, then they came back to Sri Lanka to Dambulla, uh, the whole cohort of them, and three of those bhikkhunis who had been in monastic life the longest and who were already like leaders and teachers and who were renowned for their different, you know, great uh, skills, you'd say, whether uh, being like Kamatana Charyas, recognized Vipassana meditation teachers, or, you know, leaders of nuns communities, or like this, three of them were straight away appointed as bhikkhuni preceptors for the first 1998 ordinations in Sri Lanka. And then also the bhikkhu sankha, then there was a bhikkhu preceptor as well, which is something that we don't find in Vinaya. And they started that in Sri Lanka at that time because, although in Vinaya, there's there's the Bhikkhuni preceptor, the Bhikkhuni teachers, the Bhikkhuni Sangha, and then on the Bhikkhu Sangha side, then there are Bhikkhu teachers and Bhikkhu Sangha, but there's not a Bhikkhu preceptor. There's just the Bhikkhuni preceptor, right? But the reason that they started in Sri Lanka and Dambula with having a Bhikkhu preceptor also is not only because it was being done like that in East Asia, which it was, um, but also because they were appointing bhikkhunis who had just been ordained that year to become bhikkhuni preceptors, not after 12 years mm. of experience. And so that was like to give the, the power and strength of their being the longtime preceptor who is also there and noted to be looking out for the ordination, making sure it was done right. But they did, they had intensive training four months focused on really training them as bhikkhuni preceptors be before they were appointed. Uh, and so that's the, the reason for going with that paradigm that I, I question sometimes, has it outlived its usefulness? Uh, can we go, can we just go back to the Vinaya thing then, you know, for, for that first ordination in Australia then, in 2009, many people thought because of that paradigm, pre-existing paradigm, from more than 10 years before that I was just talking about from Sri Lanka, and many people thought Ajahn Brahm was the bhikkhu preceptor, but he actually wasn't. He, he served as a it's called knowledgeable bhikkhu, so one of the, the bhikkhu teachers with the bhikkhu sangha, but actually there wasn't a bhikkhu preceptor, there was just, there was a bhikkhuni preceptor. And that time I already had 12 uh, 12 vasa uh, in the bhikkhuni life. Um, but uh, so there, there was that time and uh, experience there. Um, so I, I just, I, I wanted to mention uh, about this, about this part. Uh, so Sri Lanka bhikkhuni preceptors from 1998 started right away. And I deeply admire, especially two who I know of those first 1998 bhikkhuni preceptors uh, who have been so active internationally as well as in Sri Lanka in opening up uh, the, the full ordination. And then I was the first non-Sri Lankan, I think, to be appointed in this way. So it's not only the first Westerner, but I think the first non-Sri Lankan. Subsequently, then Venerable Bhikkhuni Damananda, uh, Terry, uh, now this year Maha Terry from Thailand, also uh, Venerable Bhikkhuni Ayasantini from Indonesia is a Bhikkhuni preceptor, Venerable Bhikkhuni Liu Fap, Viritadama Maha Terry uh, from Vietnam, also Bhikkhuni preceptor. So the point that we are now Actually, we have quite a lot of bhikkhuni preceptors who have been leading Theravada bhikkhuni communities for already, you know, more than 10, more than 12, even as much as 20 years. And from, from different 
from different countries? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, so whether in, uh, in Indonesia, in Thailand, in Vietnam, uh, here also then uh, in the United States, I did not start leading a Bikunese community immediately. Uh, I, I went to study I just went to study sincerely, so I was just like into the books to be drilling into and studying and learning Bikuni Vinaya. Then also I was going for meditation uh, retreats and also listening to and reading and studying a lot of Tama. So for the threefold training for Sila, for Samadhi and Panya, for me, for my first years, I was just really, really focused on the training I myself. Uh, which is what I understood a new Bikur or Bikuni should be doing for at least their first five or at least their first 10 years. So for myself, for my, for my first 10 years, then I was really focused in that way, uh, or at least for the first seven or, or eight years. Uh, then they <laughs> start to ask me to do other things already to start, to start picking up the duties when they saw my my 10 years is coming up, then they already, oh, yeah. some of the senior monks are already starting to eye, like there's the, there's the bikuni who is coming up on 10 years seniority, going to be 12 years soon and like making their plans, right? <laughs> uh, so yeah, it was like that. Uh, so because, because that's really the thing that was seen to be missing and, and that was really felt to be needed is having the senior bikunis and having the senior bikuni preceptors also with the with the uh, how to say it with the undisputable amount of time that Sri Lankan situation. There were a number of people who said, "What you just straight in their first year you appointed them as a bikuni preceptor?" No, 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 no. It's not according to Vinaya, right? So some people said so. Then to have the the bikuni preceptors who did have the amount of time. When I was coming up on 10 years, then I went for some Tudong time in Thailand. Wonderful, wonderful opportunity to go wandering among the forest monasteries in Thailand. And I'll just say I was there. I was very, very well received as a bhikkhuni at that time. Although most people there had never met a bhikkhuni before, just extremely well received. And the, the monks, some of them uh, were just introducing so beautifully, like especially to the to the women, they were saying, you know, because because Thai people, there is this whole cultural thing that like men have more merit, so they're able to offer something by hand directly to the bhikkhus, and then that's mm, considered right. the most meritorious way to offer, and then women have to offer indirectly through this offering cloth thing. Noting the offering cloth is not vinaya, but it's a very strong Thai culture. Tradition, yeah. that yeah, tradition to keep that sense of separation there, to not have that direct physical contact. And so then people would say that's because men have more merit. And then also because they can do that, then they get more merit. And it becomes this kind of self-perpetuating cycle where it's like they have more merit, so they get more merit, so they have more merit. And like women are out in that regard. It's like secondary or second class or, you know, can't connect in that way. So some of the monks who who I was with were like quick to catch that opportunity. They're like, ladies, come forward. Now is your chance to be able to <laughs> offer directly and by hand. And now you have, you've got a bikini here. You have, now you have this chance to get this like maximum merit in this way. And I'm, I'm not trying to condone or buy into that, that whole framework exactly, but just really to, you know, not to say yes or no to it, but just to recognize that it exists. And with the things that exist, there are the ways that they can be used to put people down or to uplift people. And in this case, what the monks was, were saying and what I could do being there was perceived as something that by the very nature of being a bhikkhuni and being physically present with them, I have the opportunity to offer this maximum merit uh, that's for their upliftment. 
And so I, I saw the ladies again and again, then with the tears in their eyes when this was being explained to them and then like wanting to come forward and to be able to do that for the first time in their lives. Uh, things were so new at that time, you know, um, because it's just the early 21st century. Yes, please. Yeah, no, it's interesting that uh, you received, I mean, notwithstanding the, that cultural kind of bias or, gen or sexism, I suppose, uh, it sounds like you were received very positively, uh, which is not necessarily what I would have expected given some of the controversy in Thailand regarding bikuni ordination. Mostly at that time, yes, I was received, I would say, very positively, but part of that has to do with Thai culture. Mm. Uh, and, you know, Thai culture is if people are, are interested in something or supportive of it, then they'll come forward and let you know they're supportive because that's nice and friendly. If they're not sure, they'll stand back and be quiet. And if they're not favorable to something, they'll they'll go to a different place and then talk behind about it, no, <laughs> but not right, in front okay. of you, right. not not confront you about it, right? Yeah. And so that makes it so for for me. Then my my experience of that was very favorable because I got the contact. My my close contacts then were all the people who were like interested and favorable and positive. And you know, then you see some people who are standing back and watching, and then then there are the people who are like disappeared, right? <laughs> and then, yeah. Yeah, right. Uh, so it's not to say that everybody was favorable, but just with that uh, like traditional Thai cultural context, then my experience was generally overwhelmingly positive. Occasionally, there were things that were not like that. There's one that stands out really strongly in my mind from the time in Thailand, and that is... Uh, being at, uh, going to visit the MCU, Mahachula Longkorn Raja Vidyalaya Royal Thai Sangha University. And, you know, in the front hall, then they've got these great metal shoe bins. And so I'd come down the stairs after a meeting with some monks there, with the rector and some other monks who were uh, at that time wanting to think about accepting international bikunis for their international master's degree program. Can I help and support that? Uh, so I came down the stairs and came to the shoe bin. I took out my sandals. I set them down. I looked up. There was a Thai lady who was looking at me and she pointed to me and like to the color of the robes on my arm. And she said, women cannot wear that color. Only monks in our Thai culture, only monks, only male monks can wear that color. And she just said that so intensely, which is very abnormal mm. for Thai people to approach someone and say something so directly and intensely. And it had this kind of like strong, negative, emotional charge that you might have even sensed in my voice in this time. And something just rose up inside me and I just looked at her and just said very clearly and plainly, that's okay. I'm a bikuni. I'm a bikuni. So it's okay. I can do it. And mm. she just looked at me and just almost like baffled at first and then like understanding what I was saying. And then she just put her hands in Angela and she's like, Kato ka, excuse me. And she just then turned around and left, right? Um, so <laughs> at that moment, I was about to go out the door to get into a van with some other monks to go and meet with Lumpur Sumedho and a number of other monks for the casting of the Abayagiri Monastery here in Northern California, a casting of the Buddha image uh, for the monastery here. So I'd been welcomed to join that event. And I just remember riding in that van together with the other monks, going to the place of casting the Buddha image, which is like, you know, people were putting their valuables in and it's like molten metal is then mm. being poured into the form of the larger and smaller Buddha images while we're all chanting together, holding the blessing string that was you know, like around everything and all, all the Sankha. And so it's like, I felt like there's something in a way almost like 
that's that's formative in a way like that molten metal with the chanting of the paritas and suttas and everything that just like rose up in me at that time from that encounter from that interaction and also from the response that arose up in me just like just very strong and calm and clear like yes i have the right to do this i can wear this because I have been fully ordained as a bhikkhuni mm. and, you know, just, just that. And I feel like it's like galvanizing, uh, really, to use this visceral language. It felt like galvanizing some kind of aditan or determination or resolve in myself, not only then to be practicing for myself up till that time, my focus had been developing my own sila, samadhi and panya really. I mean, of course, it's in the big context of the revival of bhikkhuni ordination, but it's within my first 10 years of monastic life. And uh, so that was my focus. But in that, in that moment, it's like I felt like that, that resolve, that aditan just uh, galvanized uh, in a way. And then like that Buddha image then was cooling and becoming, you know, solid in its uh, earth witness posture. Uh, and uh, or the tamachaka posture, uh, I I felt something in me like that. And I think mm. that's really when the determination came up to, like, think about uh, opening up, supporting opening up this way for others. Not only by living it myself. I had thought by living it myself that that is an offering unto itself. That's what I learned traditionally from my teachers uh, who I revered is like just doing that. You just do your own work as a monastic. You train yourself in sila, samadhi, and panya. That's addressing your own needs. That's the work. I felt the work of my heart, the katang karaniyang, to do the work that needs to be done. Uh, and then also that's an offering of the greatest merit for the world. We chanted this every day. This is like the supreme field of merit for the world. Punya ketang loka sa ti. So uh, at that moment, though, I felt like the determination to begin to bring that to another level. Mm, absolutely. And it's, it sounds like, you know, there is that that extra level of commitment that you need, certainly at that time, to be a bhikkhuni. There's like, it's just it's that little bit extra challenge or maybe a lot of extra challenge. Um, and it's really interesting to, to hear about that. Um, I'd like to move on and ask you about uh, your involvement in the North American Theravada Bhikkhuni Association and also the United Theravada Bhikkhuni Sangha International. What are these organizations, what are they aiming to achieve and what have they been focusing on recently? Hmm, thank you for asking about that. Yes, that's a jump ahead. Uh, and so then... Uh, Hmm. Uh, after a number of years uh, back in Asia, then uh, I chose to return to the United States and to California because of the great diversity of Buddhism and great Buddhist teachers in the San Francisco Bay Area. The, the culture is diverse and people and especially in the San Francisco East Bay and just all the great teachers were coming there at that time. So I felt like this is an excellent place. And I had heard about the, the monks who I knew from this area. Then they said that there were aspirants here in this area. And they were asking me, can I come back and consider about these aspirants? My venerable Bikuni mentor in South Korea also at that time hearing about this, she gave me her boon or her, it's like her injunction, her, her blessings and her directive. She said, it's the time, it's the time to go and to do that and to attend to uh, the, the needs of these aspirants. She said she had been trying to do that from the top down for so many years and she felt frustrated in being able to make progress with that, even at the highest levels. That time she was the president of the Korean National Bikuni Association, so like akin to being the, you know, not Sangharaja, but Sangharani. Uh, so leading up 10,000 Bikunis in the Korean Bikuni Sangha. 
Uh, and she said, even being in such a position, there's like <laughs> what she tried to do with her position and what she couldn't. But she said, for me, maybe from the ground up, I can do what she couldn't do. So she gave me her, her blessings to go back uh, to the United States uh, again. So I had been living in Asia then for, for a number of years. Uh, and so when I returned to the United States, then not expatriated this time by choice to Northern California, to the very diverse uh, San Francisco North Bay where I had lived previously, uh, knew many teachers and the monastic communities, Abayagiri also and Thai Forest Sankha that uh, I had mentioned before, the first Ajahn Chah monastic branch in North America. Um, so at the time that I came back, not long after that, I heard also about other Theravada bhikkhunis returning to the United States. And there was the moment when we got the news that there were five Theravada bhikkhunis in North America. And one of my mentors then, a senior Thai monk in the San Francisco North Bay, just happened to tell me in kind of classical Thai way that um, for the Council of Thai Bhikkhus in the U.S. that that had been formed, that had been recommended um, by senior monk who already passed away, great exemplar, when there were more than five Thai Bhikkhus leading up places in the U.S. and that having that harmony, having that connection, having that commitment together is so important. So I really took that direct hint uh, and got in touch with those other bhikkhunis. And then uh, from the year 2004, we formed what was originally called the North American Bhikkhuni Association with the first five of us. Uh, it's now called Theravada Bhikkhuni Association of North America. The name changed back in 2019 because the NABA NABA was taken by somebody else and it was confusing people. So we're now Tibana, which means uh, Antu Nibana. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Theravada Bhikkhuni Association of North America. Uh, so our... Um, our initial, uh, I'd say, like compact with one another was to know and to support one another and then to uh, work towards having the first uh, Bikuni Patimoka in North America, which would officially demarcate the, the presence of Bikuni Sankha in North America, and then also to collaborate in being able to receive and train aspirants. And then also our plan was within five years to offer the first Theravada, dual Theravada bhikkhuni ordination in North America. And so we made our first five-year plan at that time. And literally on the day of my 10-year anniversary in bhikkhuni life, we had our first Theravada bhikkhuni patimoka uh, recitation in North America that wow. demarcated the existence of Theravada bhikkhuni sangha in North America. And then uh, in the year number five at our Renu Bodhi Awakening Forest Hermitage in its first year of Sankha Vasa, then we offered the first Theravada dual Sankha Bhikkhuni ordination in North America. And so this was part of our um, original plan and commitment and dedication together. Uh, and let me let me jump ahead, um, conscious of time, and just say then uh, last year, uh, then um, the UTBSI United Theravada Bhikkhuni Sangha International was inaugurated on the 25 year anniversary of that first uh, ordination of 10 Bhikkhunis from Sri Lanka. Uh, in 1996 in Sarnat in India. Uh, and the UTBSI is a consortium or working group of leading Theravada bhikkhunis from around the world, uh, almost entirely those who are Theravada bhikkhuni preceptors and uh, Maha Teris, I say almost entirely, um, not a hundred percent. And our aim together has really 
number one been to work together in harmony because this is something that the Buddha has so, so highly mm. praised. And for us, you know, as strong Theravada Bhikkhuni leaders from different countries and also with, you know, like different cultural backgrounds and all this to just come together in unity and harmony and to have programs where bhikkhus are also invited to join together just in, in harmony to gather the fourfold sankha together for uh, Dhamma programs and uh, programs speaking about the um, Bikuni Sankha. So now we're thinking about September coming up and it will be the anniversary, uh, according to Sri Lankan traditions, the anniversary of the founding of the Bikuni Sankha, such a long time, more than 2,600 years ago um, per classical Theravada counting. So we're just thinking about like how to have this program together and also to uh, offer an international bhikkhuni ordination in Bodhgaya. Um, mm -hmm. this coming, hopefully this coming November, um, because there are so many who are waiting during this time of COVID, who are waiting to receive ordination. Uh, and uh, so, you know, we just have this compact really to, to know one another and to support one another and to do things in harmony together and for what we wish to see in the world in terms of harmonious fourfold community of the Buddha to just live that and enact that and support that uh, morally, support that, valorize that, moralize that as much as we can. It sounds like uh, th these networks are really quite um, new, uh, but it also sounds like there is um, quite a bit of momentum behind them at this stage. And I guess if my, my final question uh, is, um, as someone with yourself with so much um, experience and uh, knowledge of what's going on now, in the Bakuni Sangha, uh, not just in the United States, but internationally. Uh, what is your assessment of where the global Bakuni Sangha is at right now? Uh, what are its strengths and what do you feel like really still needs to be developed uh, to put it on a firmer footing? Ah, uh, well, hmm, my goodness. What a great question. Uh, I'll just say that I'm so happy to see pockets of places where the fourfold community is coming into existence in a way that I feel like is is natural and beautiful and harmonious. And I think it's really in accordance with the Buddha's vision. And although it's been more than 25 years since the revival, it's absolutely, it's not all there yet. There are so many places where that's not so. When I talked to you earlier about the recently, just this year, uh, in Bhutan, then the royals, the king and queen and queen mother and national preceptor, then that level of then choosing to give bhikkhuni ordination and to refound, in this case, the Himalayan uh, Tibetan Mula Sarvastivada Vinaya tradition, you know, that's, that's so powerful that there's that level of support and there's that uh, decision to go ahead in that way. And I feel that's just so beautiful and so excellent. And we see that the pockets of this happening uh, in Theravada Buddhism around the world. And yet it hasn't happened yet at that level of any country, you know, the leaders of that country or the, the chief um, uh, chiefs of the Sangha uh, taking that kind of decision. In Cambodia, there have been actually three Sangha Rajas who've been uh, supportive, and um, but uh, two of them, one already passed away and uh, one just of the 1998 ordination, but not really actualizing anything uh, in Cambodia. Uh, the other founding of Bikuni's community uh, in Cambodia. But I, I feel like um, 
I want to celebrate and rejoice in the great growth that there has been these pockets where there really is beautiful fourfold sankha again, uh, where we have the Terries and Maha Terries and the Bhikkhuni teachers who are really growing in all of their, their sila, their samadhi, their panya, their ability to teach and to share and to, to lead and um, where we're uniting harmoniously with one another to rejoice in all that and I, I really still see like in the United States I see this culture still so deeply embedded amongst especially amongst Asians uh, Asian Buddhists and then also um, among those who have learned from the Asian Buddhist traditions then like they're they're learning that those who are women in robes are just like less meritorious or not really worthy of supporting or like something like this uh, so that that culture is still there strongly and I feel like as as much as we can transform that culture like the Buddha's teaching is meant to meant to rehabilitate all of us and to enable us and uplift us and support us and to provide a great superstructure to do that as much as is possible with humanity. That's my understanding of the purpose of the Sangha and being the Buddha's heirs and the bearers of the Dhamma and being members of the Sangha is like just to do that as much as we we can possibly for humanity and already there are so many other challenges and difficulties and samsara and in life we shouldn't we shouldn't as buddhists we shouldn't be the ones who are putting the people down and hindering them more it's like how to unhinder and unblock and enable and support really seems to me to be the prime directive and yet people get these ideas and then get stuck in these things and so there are places there are these places where we are still very much culturally stuck and I think even with like Sri Lanka and with Thailand being like ostensibly Buddhist countries, then there are the places where the, you know, the culture is, is still quite stuck uh, in these regards. So I just uh, I want to work and encourage others to work as much as possible to really like get vision of the Buddhist prime directive and stop hindering ourselves and obstructing ourselves as much as we can and just be working to enable and support and help and uplift one another to the maximum possible because the difficulties that we've got now and coming up for us as humanity in this time on this planet are just so enormous i feel like the directive has to be like you know practice as best we can to not only just for ourselves, but also to be able to then share the Dhamma and share the path and be able to, you know, work with the grave difficulties that are present as best we can, and then also help out others to do so, train others to do so as much as possible. That's not a new thing in Buddhism. It's just, I mean, that's the thing all the time, but we're just talking about our current situation. I feel like this is really important to see this clearly there are many things in buddhist culture but this is something that i see as like being the essential elements of buddhist culture far more so than any particular form of buddha images or you know language or printing of uh, texts or which vinaya tradition or even right uh, all of these things, but just to enable what the Buddha taught and to live it, practice it, and share it for the welfare and the benefit of the people in grave and uh, dire uh, suffering and need that we see now. And we know there's going to be a lot of, uh, I don't know, we used to say like, um, it's old expressions like the, when the when the dung hits the fan, right? Yeah. Uh, so we're, I think we've got some of that happening and there's going to be even more of that uh, coming up. And there's just so much of benefit and good and of help here for us individually and collectively. Let us just 
live this and do this and offer this and support this as much and as best we can. I think that's so well said, and I think you've really cut to the heart of the matter. Uh, and I think just one of the things I just wanted to follow up with, just as the final point uh, for this interview, is that whilst there is certainly um, a lot of, I guess, cultural views which can hold us back, and particularly, I guess, certain like cultural prejudices which um, hinder the development of the Bakuni Sangha in some places. But one thing I've noticed, um, it's, it's almost like a positive problem it, it, uh, from, from where I'm here in Australia is that uh, there is such great interest uh, from women who want to take on the monastic path. It's, and in fact, it's as if that demand to do that outstrips the ability to some extent of um, mm. our current Terry's to uh, to be able to support them, um, and and I and, and just connecting with what you said about you know the significant problems in the world today. Uh, I mean, that's, undoubtedly that's true. These are existential problems for humanity, uh, like climate yeah. change and and potential you know international conflict and so forth. But one of the things that I've noticed is um, that when people you know are suffering, that's often when um, spirituality becomes much more relevant to them. Um, and indeed, the Buddha said that suffering conditions faith. Um, I can't help but feel that, you know, maybe what's happening, it's, it's, it's at the right time. And that, and I just, I just, I, I, I'm hopeful, but uh, I mean, how can we support the Bhikkhuni Sangha uh, and all the women who really earnestly want to go forth and, uh, and practice, uh, how can how can we really support that going forward in the next couple of decades, do you think? Mm, thank you for asking that. You know, here in the United States, we tend to look at what's going on in Australia, especially connected to the Buddhist Society of Western Australia and also Santee Forest and then uh, also... Newbury, and we we tend to think like the situation, especially with the BSWA, is like so great to be uh, like showing a fourfold community and for women to be able to come and have great, well supported opportunities for training. And then we look at ourselves in the United States, and we think, wow, our, our situation is like we don't we don't have something like that uh, set up. We uh, so I'm interested to hear your perspective uh, saying your, what you're saying there. I don't know how many aspirants show up to, say, Damasara or uh, the Bikuni Monastery in Western Australia uh, on a yearly basis. I know here with Damadarini since 2005, the year that we started, consistently every year 50 to 100 people contact us who are interested in exploring uh, ordination or they're already in a form of monastic life or a level and you know further uh, further ordaining and that has not slowed down this year so far actually I think in terms of aspirants it might even be a record-breaking year <laughs> for the first months of this year but that is incredible uh, that's that's a lot I mean you know I know I jump up. Ajahn Brahm likes to say he's got a monk factory, but it's not like that at all. It's more like a nursery, and it takes a lot of care and nurturing yeah, to this develop is the, thing. the early stages. This is the thing. So and 50, also, that's a yeah. lot. <laughs> it's a lot. And so what we really, uh, what we have been able to support in the time that Damodrini has existed is normally like one or two every year or every other year out of all that. And I want to look at that as a success. Hmm. Because then that means, uh, you know, additionally, one or two every year, or every other year. So that's like growing, growing, growing numbers. So then I participated, I think, in now like 67 ordinations or uh, if we count unique ordinations, uh, recognizing that for some they've had, you know, various stages. We're counting that. Um, so then what about all those other 
people every year and we do recommend that they check out other places and we've tried to encourage the founding and the development of you know more and more other places that there be greater opportunity and those who are aspirants uh, will be able to find a place where there is the support for them to be able to enter and so I still very much feel like there, there's just so much more than we are able to really well handle and well care for here. And we're, we're developing at the, at the speed of the internal and external support that we have. And the external support is a place where we often feel the limitation. We can develop as much as what people offer in their free will offerings. And when we come up to the end of that, you know, that's where we stop because that's what we with this life have to work with. And so we work on our internal support structures, our own practice and our ability to share with and receive and serve others, recommend them to other places also. We're working with that, but I'm very much aware of how many aspirants, how many more aspirants there are than what we're able to care for. And I'm aware on the other side also for the invitations. Since the beginning of Damadrini, it's been also consistent every single year. The people who want to invite Bikuni teachers, the people who want to invite the senior bhikkhunis who are able to lead retreats, who are able to give teaching, they want to invite the bhikkhuni leaders and, you know, to have teachings from them and all, all of this. And those invitations just keep coming and coming and coming. And so there are the two sides of it. When Ajahn Brahm, Longpur Brahm, uh, talks about the monk factory, there's the part about the aspirants and being able to serve the aspirants and their wish, their intention. We don't have to drum up aspirants. There's more of them yeah. than we can handle well. Um, but it's like supporting the aspirants and then that then serves the other end for all those people who want the senior, who want the product. They want the senior bhikkhunis, they want the bhikkhuni mm. teachers, the bhikkhuni preceptors, the bhikkhuni leaders. That doesn't come out of nothing. And it takes a little while. Uh, so it's like how much support people are putting into it, then that really connects to then our ability to offer the teachings, to offer the refuge, to offer the, the opportunities that the people very much want. So there's, there's no shortage of aspirants and there's no shortage of the people who want the teachings. <laughs> There's, there's more <laughs> than we can handle in those regards. Uh, it's just like how much support is there that we can then well process that to be able yeah. to then serve the aspirants needs and serve the needs of those who, who want the teachings, who want to have the contact with those senior, knowledgeable, senior, blessed, Bikuni seniors. Yeah. Look, I think that's an excellent place to wrap it up. And I'm going to say um, to the listeners, you know, that it's really important to support Bakunis if they've if you've got Bakunis nearby or if they're far away. Um, if you want to have the the teachers of the future, we've got to support uh, the, uh, the the Bakunis, the juniors, the middle Bakunis here and now in order for that to come to fruition. I'm going to put a link to uh, uh, the donation page for Damodarani Monastery uh, in the description below, uh, and if uh, you've got even a little, a few dollars that you can spare, that can be one uh, modest way in which you can support uh, them going forwards. And but if you see them going on arms round, you know, go dive into that uh, supermarket, get them something good to eat, um, or whatever you can do in whatever way you can. I think it's very worth well worth doing. I want to uh, thank Aya Tataloka for uh, giving her time to share with us her really incredible experience, which uh, uh, is at that confluence of all the different things that are happening internationally uh, as well as in the United States. Uh, I really want to thank you, Aya, for taking the time to talk to us today. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you very much for inviting. And I just want to absolutely agree about supporting the bhikkhunis and the fourfold community, especially the bhikkhunis uh, all around the world, uh, everywhere, uh, as much as you can, where there are those sincerely practicing. It's just such a big offering. And I think, you know, supporting ourselves in the path and supporting uh, one another and each other in the path is what the Sankha 
uh, is for, and then to share the fruits of that together. So uh, that's the great offering for the world together with the Buddha, the Buddha's heart and the Buddha's intention. So um, just absolutely animo tena sa tu sa tu sa tu to everyone who's doing that together. And um, thanks so much for inviting me, Saul. And thank you to all our listeners for joining us for this inspiring episode of Treasure Mountain with Ayatata Loka, a nun at the forefront of developing the Bhikkhuni Sangha in the West and the Buddhist community of practice more broadly in the United States. You can find out more about Ayatata Loka's biography and about Dhammadharani Monastery in California by following the links in the description below. Also, you can find out more about Treasure Mountain Podcast by going to www.treasuremountain.com info website where you can find all the previous episodes and information about all our guests if you enjoyed this podcast you can subscribe to treasure mountain podcast using your favorite podcast app in order to get notified about future episodes and don't forget to tell your friends about treasure mountain too i've got more inspiring episodes more guests coming up in the future weeks and until then i wish you all the best on your spiritual voyage